So tonight, uh, on the occasion of the of Good Friday, although it's the Catholic date, uh, Good Friday for the Orthodox uh, will be next week. Uh, but I thought it would be a good um, a, a good opportunity to present uh, one of the treasures of the uh, Christian tradition, which is um, hesychasm. Uh, hesychasm has um, been described by some people as a sort of uh, the Christian equivalent of yoga. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, it's it, there might be some truth in it, but I would be very careful with uh, with, with these sort of uh, uh, comparisons. But uh, let's just move on to um, basically the the, the 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 main subject. So, so here's the the plan of the presentation. Uh, so, Hesychasm, Eastern Christianity's uh, mystical tradition. I should add, actually, Eastern Orthodox. Uh, um, Christian mystical tradition because there's different types of Eastern Christianity. Not all forms of Eastern Christianity are Orthodox. So this is really specific to the Orthodox tradition. Um, for those who not who are not aware, so there's a there's a, um, there's a traditional Christianity is usually divided into two big uh, families. You have the the Catholic Church and then you have the Orthodox Church. Uh, the split between the two has not much to do with doctrine. The doctrines are pretty much the same, um, except for some minute points. But the, the, it's a dispute of, on authority. Who has authority over the church? The Orthodox Church um, presents the idea that all of the patriarchs, the, the heads of the different national churches, um, are equal amongst themselves. And that the Bishop of Rome, who is the Patriarch of Rome, is only primum, um, primus inter pares. He's the, 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 the first amongst equals, but he has no, he, he does not, he cannot have absolute power over the church. The Catholic Church, however, has another position. And, and of course, beyond that, there are, of course, um, major cultural differences um, that I, will, I have no time to get into. But uh, as the name suggests, the Eastern Orthodox uh, Church has remained very much closer to the Mediterranean environment in which Christianity was originally born. So there's a certain continuity in Orthodoxy that some people might uh, appreciate. So the plan of the lecture is the following. So the origins and history of the Hesychast tradition. And secondly, balancing grace and technique, the divinizing the human being. And then uh, thirdly, the Hesychast tradition and other mystical traditions. So um, how do I start? First of all, with the, the, the term Hesychast. So the Hesychast is, the term Hesychast is actually the adjective of the, of the, um, of the noun, Hezuchia, Hezuchia, which basically means silence, peace. And it refers to the silencing or the, the, the peace of the soul that um, basically the soul experiences when it unites with the beloved, with, with God. And so it's a very ancient tradition that goes all the way back to the first centuries of Christianity. Of course, it has the, the, the Orthodox tradition would, would tell you that it goes back to Jesus Christ, Christ himself and the apostles. But, um, and so, and that's therefore part of the, uh, of the tradition, but, it becomes really formalized over time, you know, with, with, with the centuries. So usually um, the first person who's mentioned in, in the, the lineage of the, the people who helped formalize the Hesychast tradition is, of course, Anthony the Great. Uh, so the, 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 the founder of Christian monasticism. Um, so one has to ask oneself, why is it that in the third and the fourth century, uh, at a time when Christianity had pretty much won its fight over the Roman Empire, um, why is it that you have this ascetic movement, um, you know, emerging in in the church and this this move towards monasticism? And the the, the answer can be found in a, a very interesting um, um, saying that I've. I've heard a lot when I was when I, when I was younger, um, which is that the church fears Constantine more than Nero. 
what do I mean by this? Uh, the the church has, um, even though the church was heavily persecuted for three centuries, um, and it underwent uh, a great deal of ordeals, and and uh, you have like you know a lot of people who were um, executed in absolutely gruesome ways. Uh, under the Roman authorities because they would not participate in the state cults. Um, you were, if you were a Roman citizen in those days, you had, you had to worship the emperor. Um, so, and, 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 I mean, depending on, depending, on the, uh, depending on the emperor, of course, and some emperors didn't take themselves too seriously from that point of view. But it was sort of um, understood that if you were a Roman citizen, you had to pay uh, you had to worship. You had to burn incense in front of the uh, the statue of the emperor as a as a sign that you were fully loyal to 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 the emperor. And the Christians wouldn't do it. And so this brought about a great deal of persecution uh, because the Christians were seen as people who were disloyal to inherently disloyal to the state. Um, but eventually, with Constantine. Um, uh, the, the church triumphs, triumphs over its enemies and actually becomes a state religion. And this is where you find amongst a lot of ascetics, a lot of spiritual people within the church, the needs to create a movement that would um, clean the church, uh, clean the church of, or, or purge the church from... Um, the corrupting element of power. So from, very, from the very beginning, um, you had what one calls the, anti the anti-clericalism of the saints, meaning that a lot of people within the uh, Christian tradition were very well aware of the dangers of political power and uh, the influences and uh, the influence that the power has over, over, over the heart and how it corrupts the, the human heart. So it's not like uh, I mean that's it's not it's really not like the you know the vulgar you know Protestant um, narrative according to which you know that the church is all made up of um, power hungry priests and bishops who are just out there to suck the blood of uh, blood of the people. Uh, the church was very much aware that this danger was there, and that's why there has been this movement towards bringing the fights to the enemy. And the enemy is the devil, is, is, is Satan. And in the ancient tradition, the, the, the desert was seen as the dwelling place of demons. I mean, if we read the Gospels, the first thing that Christ does after the baptism in the Jordan River is that he moves to the desert and uh, remains there for 40 days. And, and that's because Christ brings the fights directly into the territory of the enemy, which is, you know, the, 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 um, who, who's the devil and his terrain is, 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 is the desert. Of course, the desert in a, in a symbolic way as well, right? Uh, so you, you have, see this emergence of, of um, monasteries all over the Christian world, but especially in Egypt. And what, what I mean by desert, it, it's not desert in the sense that we understand today as, an, as sort of um, the desert we find in the Middle East. Desert in the Christian tradition means the wilderness. So uh, moving into the wilderness in order to confront the devil, um, in order to wage inner spiritual warfare. So you have these warriors of God who are these um, monks and nuns who move into the wilderness in order to, um, in order to, to, to fight uh, the demonic forces. Right, and very often it's the idea is that the monastery, in a sense, is the the fortress that keeps the worst of the demonic attacks away from the rest of society as well. So there is a there's also a socio political function, although on a mystical level of the of the monastery and of monasticism. So um, monastics are basically the warriors of God, and, and but it's also the idea that. Um, in order, in order to bring a harmony into the world, the only way is not through conquering, uh, you know, uh, power over the states. The, the, the only possible way to do that is through conquering evil within ourselves. And, it's, um, and, and just like, you know, um, 
uh, Solzhenitsyn uh, beautifully said, the line between that, the, the line that divides good and evil is within all of us. Uh, it's very, it's very, um, it's very illusory. It's very um, stupid to think that you know it, it, we just need to identify a certain group of people in society and get rid of them, and then everything would be solved. And you know it just doesn't work. And there's also the fact that you know uh, after Christianity, you know, became a state religion, uh, that did not take away sin and corruption away from society. So there's a there's this also this awareness that. The only way to rid society of all these evils is through inner spiritual warfare. One of the first, uh, so beyond Anthony the Great, who's the founder of uh, Christian monasticism, uh, and who created the first rules for monastics uh, in, um, in Christianity, around the same time, you have Evagrius Ponticus, uh, who identifies the, the eight spirits, uh, the logismoi, were the sources of all temptation and of spiritual diseases. Uh, so the first one is gastrimargia, or the madness of the guts. So it's um, it's often uh, translated as gluttony, but by extension, it 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 it, um, it refers to all oral pathologies that are linked to the to the stomach, to the appetite, and uh, to basically what Freud would call the oral phase, right? And um, and so he pro he proposes a cure for every uh, for each one of these eight logismos for gastrimargia. Uh, so this can be cured through uh, oral recitation and si singing of sacred texts, but also through fasting. I should say from the onset that um, especially the, the, the Christian uh, monastic tradition, but especially the Orthodox one, has placed a great deal of emphasis on a um, semi-vegetarian diet for, 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 for the monks and has even encouraged it for the laity as well. So Orthodox monks and some Catholic orders as well don't eat meat at all. Um, um, on, on feast days, they might have fish, but the rest of the day, the rest of the year, it's pretty much a vegetarian diet uh, on Mount Athos, which is an is, it's a it's a, it's a half island, it's a peninsula in Greece, which is actually an independent monk republic in Greece, um, because women are not allowed on that island, and also no female animals. Uh, the monks the monks also have a, their diet is um, completely uh, devoid of um, uh, cheese and milk and, and eggs as well. So they had ever have a semi-vegan, semi-pescatarian uh, diet, which is more suitable for uh, spiritual pursuits. So this diet in and of itself is already a way of healing uh, this, 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 order, this, this order of, um, you know, uh, that is gastrimargia. Uh, so the second logismo is porneia. And of course, in porneia, you recognize the term that gives you know, the, the, the Greek term uh, porne, which just means prostitute, which gives, you know, which is the origin that, that later on becomes pornography, for example. So um, it's prostitution, but uh, by extension, of course, it's fornication and by extension, all sexual deviancy. So um, any, any form of sexuality uh, outside of marriage is, is, of course, seen as porneia. Uh, masturbation is seen as porneia and uh, anything other than basically heterosexual um, intercourse within marriage is basically seen as as porneia. But not only the actions, but even the, 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 the thought of it. And the idea is that um, one should not reduce other, one should not reduce the other as a means, as a sole means for, for, for pleasure. Uh, because it denies the divine dimension of that other person. And so um, porneia can be healed through a regulation of one's food and drink, especially there's an emphasis on drinking less in order to, to heal that, um, that disease, disease within us. There's also an emphasis on manual work uh, because um, people who work manually are less, um, are less tempted uh, because they're busy using, uh, well, working with their hands. And so their sole focus is, is, uh, is on that work. And of course, reflection of the Holy Scriptures. 
And that the reflection of the Holy Scriptures is to basically make your brain active with, thing, with holy things because the, the biggest sexual organ is actually the, um, the brain. So the, the porneia actually uh, would, would correspond more or less to what Freud calls the genital phase. By the way, I'm not saying that, um, you know, I'm not a big admirer of Freud, uh, but um, some authors on hesychasm have just pointed out that in, uh, at this level, uh, Freud seems to have some, some things right. So these diseases are actually seen as, uh, how to put it, as, as, um, as manifestations of the of the um, of the, the the lack of spiritual de- uh, the lack of spiritual development of the human being. So these are these are aspects of our personality that are still in infancy, and because they're in infancy, they're deregulated. They're um, they're out of balance. So this is a, is a instead of using a t- um, using a language that is, that is focused on you know guilting um, on guilt and shame. It's more seen as a, the, the language of hesychasm is, is actually very close to that of psychotherapy. Uh, some people call hesychasm the, the, you know, the, the, the spiritual psychotherapy of Orthodox Christianity. It's more about healing people rather than making them feel guilty about these spiritual dexi- diseases. Um, then uh, you have philargiria, which basically is the love of money. And by extension, any possessive disorder um, and the possessive disorder does not necessarily mean that um, one, um, so this is basically greed, but greed can have many forms. You can, you, can, you can be poor, you can be a monk and still be greedy, right? Um, and the beautiful example of it is Gollum in the Lord of the Rings. He only has one possession, right? Uh, otherwise, he, le- he lives a very ascetic sort of life, eating raw fish and living in a wilderness. But he has this one ring that he's, he's attached to. So the, 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 the idea is that uh, um, philargiria turns us into consumers rather than people who commune with the world. And the idea is not to see the world around us as commodities to be, to be consumed. So we, we should not see, at, we, we should not look at nature. Uh, we should not look at you know the people around us as means to to be possessed, but rather things with which we are we are in communion with uh, in, through God's grace. And this can be cured through meditation on on death. Um, one of the famous sayings that Eastern Orthodoxy has is, "Die before you die, so you won't die when you die." Uh, incidentally, when I used to teach uh, at university, I used to have this saying uh, above my, <laughs> at the entrance of my door <laughs> for my students to see. Um, and it would trigger conversations. But yeah. um, then you have orge, which is wrath and impatience. And uh, it, it's very often seen also as a, as a pendant to pornaya. So, the, the, the wrath and impatience and anger is seen as a pendant to, um, to lust, basically. And it can be cured through loving kindness, uh, compassion, and so on and so forth. Uh, then you have lupe, which means sadness, envy, frustrations. Uh, lupe, is the, um, uh, lupe is the sort of sadness that you experience when you see other people's happiness. Uh, so that's why it's often also trans translated as envy. And it, it, it can only be cured really through joy. Joy um, of two kinds. One of uh, the joy of contentment, uh, being grateful for what one has, and also joy, of, joy of experiencing joy for what other people have, right? Then uh, you have uh, Akedia, uh, sorry, Akedia, which basically is Assyria. Uh, so Assyria is a specific type of spiritual um, disease. It's a, um, and that is why it's. I think it's wrong to translate it as sin. It's it's more a spiritual crisis. It's the moment. It's the sort of the uh, spiritual midlife crisis of, of the mystic. It's there. It's a. There's a point where God seems to have removed His presence from one's life, and then one is basically left to wonder. Uh, you know what is happening. 
one feels rejected by God. And one starts to question really one's purpose. And this sort of spiritual depression brings one to stop practicing, to become spiritually lazy, and sometimes to fall into the other uh, logismoi. So, uh, you know, you've been a monk for, or uh, you've been engaged on this path for many years, and then you go through this phase, and then you, you tell yourself, well, I've been wasting all of my time. And then you, and it's a very, that's why uh, Akedia is a very dangerous imbalance, because it leads you also to, to fall into the trap of basically giving in to all the others. And that one is a really um, uh, tough nut to crack. And, and it can only be cured by constant prayer and, and, and developing hope. And it's a really difficult one. Um, then you have uh, kenodoxia, which means boasting or vainglory. And it can only be cured by gnosis. And by, what I mean by gnosis is knowledge of one's true self. When you recognize that you're only a sack of skin uh, full of pus and blood and urine and other things, uh, and then you have a very limited uh, lifespan here on Earth, um, the claims you make about oneself basically, you know, just just basically take a take a hit, and and that's what um, that's what what we hear what we understand here by by gnosis. Um, so then you have uh, hyperifania, which means pride or foolishness, and it can only be cured by uh, humility. Uh, so these eight logismoi, they, they find the equivalent, for example, in, in, in the Indic tradition. I mean, last week we spoke about Sikhism. In the Sikh scripture, we speak of Kam, Krod, uh, Lob, Mo, and Ankar, right? Uh, lust, anger, uh, greed. Of um, delusion and then arrogance, right? So these are the five evil, the five chore, basically, that you find in sea scripture. So um, all the major traditions have a sort of the equivalent list of, um, of spiritual enemies. Uh, then you have uh, John Cassian, uh, so who who, um, who basically further develop uh, uh, further develops the uh, the idea of the logismoi and the ramifications of them. So he explains here, uh, orgies and drunkenness come from gluttony. Um, coarseness, buffoonery, mockery, and foolishness are born out of from, from lust. Avarice uh, breeds uh, lies, deceit, theft, false testimony. Seeking dishonest gain, sorry, seeking dishonest uh, gain, violence, harshness, greed, um, anger arouses um, climbers and sorry, uh, I have to homicides, clamors, indignation, sadness gives birth to resentment, bitterness, pusillanimity, um, uh, despair, acedia gives rise to uh, it, um, idleness, drowsiness, imp um, importunity. Uh, uses as its agitation of wandering, um, inconstancy, bodily or spiritual, chatter, curiosity, vainglory. Uh, vainglory is the mother of quarrel, sex, arrogance, uh, bias for novelties. Uh, as for pride, it produces contempt, envy, insubordination, blasphemy, criticism, and uh, denigration. So, and with, um, basically, with John Cassian, you already have the idea of unceasing prayer coming into, um, into, into, into place in, in, the, um, in, the, uh, in the formulation of the Hezekiah's doctrine. So he says, any monk who claims, uh, who aims at the continual remembrance of God must accustom himself to murmuring inwardly and to constantly repeating in his heart the formula that I am about to deliver to you. And for that reason, drive out the multitude of other thoughts, for he will not be able to hold only um, to hold only if he sees himself free. Uh, so he frees himself from all the cares and concerns of the body. This is a doctrine to which we have been initiated by the few survivors of the most ancient fathers, and which we only deliver to the privileged few who really thirst to know it. To continually preserve the memory of God, you must therefore constantly keep present in your mind this holy formula. My God, 
come to my aid. Lord, make haste to help me. Psalm 69, verse 2. It is not without reason that this verse was chosen from all sacred scripture. It expresses all the feelings that human nature can conceive. It is perfectly suited to all states' interpretations. We find there the invocation of God against all dangers, the humility of a humble and pious confession, the vigilance which proceeds uh, from a constant attention and fear, the concentration of our fragility, the, co the confidence to be answered, the assurance to, uh, of help, um, always present and ready to intervene, for he who ceaselessly invokes his protector is assured of having him always present. So already here you have this idea of being in a state of consciousness where you're in constant prayer and how to basically achieve that state. And um, it's, it's, it's a very important theme in the Hezekiah's tradition. So in the fifth century, you have the other coach of Potiki who um, further uh, elaborates on, on this notion of unceasing prayer, but then adds that the best formula really is to invoke the name of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus himself is the name of God. Uh, as we explained last, um, last uh, week, the, the Logos is, so to speak, to God what the letter is to the sound that represents it. So... Uh, all of the scriptures can basically can be same, uh, summed up in the very name of, uh, of Jesus. So that the invocation of, the, G of the, the name of Jesus becomes in the Hazikas tradition, really the focal point of practice. So he writes, the intellect absolutely demands of us when we close all the outlets uh, by the remembrance of God, a work which must satisfy its uh, need for, uh, for activity. We must therefore give him the Lord Jesus as the only occupation that fully meets his goal. Indeed, it is written, no one says Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. But let him at all times contemplate this word so exclusively in his own treasures that he turns not to any imagination. All those indeed who ceaselessly meditate in the depth of their heart, uh, this holy and glorious name, those who can finally see the light of their own intellect, for held with close care by uh, thought, it consumes um, in intense feeling all the defilement that causes the surface of the soul. And indeed, our God, it is said, is a consuming fire. Uh, consequently, henceforth, the Lord invites the soul to a great love of, uh, of his own glory, because when it persists through the intellectual, mem uh, intellectual memory in the fervor of the heart, this glorious and so desirable name implants in us the habit of loving its goodness without anything henceforth opposing it. It is indeed the precious pearl that one can buy by selling all one's possessions to enjoy uh, at a discovery an ineffable joy. For this prayer then carries the, that grace which meditates with the soul and calls it Lord Jesus Christ. As a mother would teach her son and repeat with him the name father until instead of any other childish language, she enables him to uh, call his father clearly, even during his sleep. Now, this during uh, even during his sleep is very important because. A lot of the a lot of the great authors of the Hesychast tradition emphasize the fact that the true Hesychast is someone who manifests the verse two of Canto five of the Song of Songs, um, where it said, um, I'm asleep, but my heart is awake. Uh, so the idea is that even when one sleeps, one is still in a state of conscious prayer. And, and uh, I will talk about this specific point at the end of the lecture because it's, uh, it has a lot to do with developments within the, um, the Islamic and also Buddhist tradition. Now, uh, John Klimakos in the 6th and 7th century further adds, um, uh, 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 adds to this whole theory, uh, formulation of the Hezekiah's tradition with this book uh, of the Holy Ladder. So um, John Klimakos, uh, by the way, uh, Klimakos comes from the Greek Klimak, which means ladder, right? So he says that 
the spiritual path is a ladder, a ladder with 13, uh, 30 steps. And so these 30 steps are actually grouped into uh, five different, group, five different um, uh, groups. So steps one to four is the renouncing of the world and uh, seeking a spiritual father that you will obey. Uh, for, uh, for the Hezekiah tradition, it's very important to find a spiritual father who's your confessor uh, and wh from whom you may seek spiritual advice. And thank goodness the, the, um, you know, the Orthodox tradition still has a, 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 you know, a, lot of, um, a lot of spiritual fathers. They're not, I mean, they don't, you, you, you won't find them at every street corner, but there's, there's, there are still some accessible uh, spiritual fathers out there who can, who just like a, a Sufi sheikh, give you instructions on meditation um, and on your spiritual life. And, and um, in my interaction with Orthodox people, uh, the spiritual father is a very important person. Then you have uh, steps five to seven. Uh, so penitence and repentance uh, as doors to real joy. So after having renounced the world, it's about really um, looking at one's soul and looking at those um, spiritual diseases that one has basically um, acquired uh, through one's interaction with, with the world and then healing them. Uh, and this healing process is the next step, which is steps eight to 17, um, the struggle against the vices and the acquisition of virtues. And actually the struggle against the vices can only be achieved through the acquisition of virtues, right? So, you know, uh, anger must be fought against with compassion. Um, greed must be fought against with, uh, with generosity and so on and so forth, right? So, the, so you, for each vice, there's a, there's a corresponding virtue that if you exert it, will heal you from a specific vice. Then you have the steps 18 to uh, 26. So that's uh, flight away from the traps of ascesis, of ascetic practice, which is laziness, arrogance, and acedia. L why is this? Because some, a lot of, you, you'll find a lot of people on the spiritual path, um, you know, in, in the in their first years, very often experience uh, some, you know, rather miraculous um, uh, events or, or experiences, right? Uh, so some people may see angels, other people may even be able to smell paradise. Um, this is something that, you know, in Islam that, you know, occurs a lot, especially at the uh, initial stages of the suluk, of this uh, spiritual um, of the spiritual um, uh, of the spiritual wayfaring, uh, you have people who experience these things. But it, these things are tests because um, if you take yourself too seriously, you'll think that you know you just reached a very important spiritual level, and that will lead you to become spiritually lazy, but also arrogant. And when all of these, when all of these gifts are taken away by God as a test, you may find yourself in a state of acedia, of complete dejection and spiritual depression, which may lead you to, you know, uh, fall like some of the chaps here in that ladder. A ladder, you have these little devils, you know, with their with their sticks poking at them and making them fall away from from the ladder. So it's very important to be on one's watch, um, you know, and, and, and that is why the presence of a spiritual father is so important. Then you have the steps 27 to 29, uh, 29 uh, reaching the, the silence, peace, or hezuchia of the soul, and impassibility, the apathia. So apathia does not mean the apathetic, that you, have, that you don't feel nothing. No, no. It means that um, you might... You might you might experience anger, for example, but it does not shake the inner core of your being. You might experience uh, fear or surprise or whatever, uh, but it does not shake the inner core of your being. That's what apathia actually means. You're not driven anymore by your, by your pathos, by, by, by your emotions and by your passions, because you know, you, you know the real core of being. Uh, step 30 is actually a recap of all the, steps 
so just a reading here from, from step 10 on judging others. Um, and I added this because I needed to remind to be reminded of this for myself because I have a tendency to do that quite a lot. So it's on judging others. So do not lose. So um, basically, um, uh, John Clee Marcos writes, do not lose sight of this and you'll be very, uh, and you'll be very careful not to judge a sinner. Judas was one of the apostles and the thief of the number of murderers. But what an amazing change in that instance. I knew a man who had sinned in plain sight, but repented of it in secret. And he whom I condemned as lustful was chased in the sight of God, for he had appeased him by true conversion. Fire is constant, uh, is contrary to water. In the same way, judging others is foreign to those who want to do penance. When you see someone committing sin at the moment of his death, even then do not judge him, for the judgment of God is inscrutable to man. If this statement is true, and it certainly is, from the judgment by which you judge, you will be judged. Then any sin, whether of the, of the soul or of the body, of which we accuse our neighbor, we ourselves will fall into it. The demons force us either to sin, or if we do not sin, to judge others who sin, in order to defile our innocence with this judgment. To judge others is not to be ashamed or usurping a is not to be ashamed of usurping a divine prerogative. To condemn them is to ruin uh, your own soul. I'm reminded here of a, of a beautiful story of a, of a recent um, Hesychast saint from Mount Athos. Uh, I don't remember his name. But someone, a doctor came to Mount Athos and asked him, um, well, actually didn't ask him. He, he, he was extremely depressed. And so the saint asked him, um, are you, uh, the saint could of course read into his heart that are you, are you sad because of your son? And the doctor said, how do you know about my son? Uh, and uh, the saint said, well, I know that he, he, com he committed suicide. He threw himself out of the window and you are worried as to whether or not he's in hellfire for all eternity. And the doctor says, yes, so that's actually what is worrying me. And the saint said, you should not worry. First of all, you don't know if in the last minute he did not repent just before. From the moment that he jumped out of the window to the moment he, he reached the floor and eventually died, um, even in that space, he had the time to repent. And he did. And you should not, you should not worry. And it's, it's, it's a very beautiful lesson um, that, you know, um, "Quote unquote," religious people of any denomination have such a tendency to judge others, um, and uh, um, it's important to 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 remember that you know all of us have have to deal with our own um, idiosyncrasies, with our own spiritual battles, and with um, with our fallible and um, and broken natures, and that um, it really is only God who. Uh, can heal us from them, but also only God can really judge us. Um, so a new evolution arises in the 10th and 11th century. So as these spiritual experiences are being, you know, um, lived by these community of, communities of monks, but also laity, you have the emergence of, of a new type of mystical theology. And this is where Eastern Orthodoxy starts to really have its own sort of theological language. Uh, Simeon, the new theologian, the uh, Byzantine uh, theologian from the um, 10th and 11th century, focuses a lot on the notion of the uncreated light. So uh, those of you who might be um, familiar with the Gospels will remember that, uh, for example, in Matthew 17, Jesus uh, takes three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, to Mount Tabor. And on Mount Tabor, the following thing happens. I'm just going to read from the gospel. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the, as, as the light. Just, when there, just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. 
Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three, sh three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen, listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. So here comes the question, right? So these mystics experience these different phenomena in these higher states of consciousness. And one that keeps recurring is the experience of light, right? Um, and not in a symbolic way, but very much in a very, very real way. So is that possible? And this is what started a certain controversy around the um, 14th century. There was an Orthodox monk by the name of Barlam of Calabria, who, uh, although Orthodox, was very much trained in the uh, Catholic scholastic tradition. And he criticized the Hesychas as people who were just basically chasing after the senses. Uh, because for him, any knowledge that we have of God can only be propositional um, and can only be known through, discur through the discursive mind and through reason. And that uh, we cannot experience God through the senses because God is so different from the senses. And then came the champion of Greek Orthodox, um, oh, sorry, of Eastern Orthodox theology, and especially a champion of uh, who came in. Uh, defense of hesychasm, Gregory Palamas, who argued on the contrary that um, God can be experienced uh, through his uncreated light, just in the same way the apostles experienced the uncreated light on Mount Tabor because of the Aristotelian principle of those who become light can see the light. And this light is part of God's energias, these energies. So these are these cataphatic uh, these self, the, the self manifestations of God, whatever God states about Himself, right, that uh, basically can be experienced by the mystic, and it is with the energias that the um, that the mystic can become one with. So, um, so God has, to get, of course, has two aspects. He has his, he has his usia, his essence which is uh, basically forever unknowable. And that is also why in the Hezekiah tradition, um, there's a strong emphasis on not meditating on any images of not having any form of visualization at all, because even the highest angels have not seen, have not perceived the essence of God. However, as a result of um, God's grace and one's own practice of the Hesychast path, God may manifest himself uh, as light in, 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 in the life of the mystic. And that is what is called the, um, uh, the, 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 the sacred marriage between the soul, between the bride, which is the soul, and the bridegroom, which is Christ. Now. Very often, one hears that hesychasm is the yoga of, you know, Christianity, of Eastern Christianity. And Eastern Christians have a problem with that because while it is true that the hesychast tradition has a technical aspect, it's not as if, you know, um, it's not like in the way that modern yoga is very often um, uh, described meaning that you, you, you use a certain technique and then you get this and this results. And the, 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 the orthodox tradition will be, would be would categorically say that, no, that is not how it works. Yes, there is a technique. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, certain, there's a certain physical action that, may, that can prepare the coming of grace. But really what it is here, it's the merging of the, 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 the divine will 
with the human will. And so the, 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 on, so on the one hand, you have God's grace descending. On the other hand, you have the human, the human effort ascending. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a merger, it's a union of an ascending movement coming from, this, from, from the human being. But eventually, what is more important is the descending movement of grace. The idea really is to bring the Holy Spirit to make the Holy Spirit descend into the very core of our beings, not just the spiritual core of our beings, but also our physical ones, because we are, we're not just our minds or our souls, we're also the body. So the idea is also to spiritualize the body, to prepare ourselves for resurrection where all matter will be spiritualized, which is, which, so it's a preparation for resurrection. So nowadays, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, there's a certain formula known as the Jesus prayer that is repeated by the practitioners of uh, hesychasm, be they monks or laity. And the, the, the prayer, which can be repeated in any language, is Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the usually the posture that is taken by the practitioner is the one that I'm that basically you can see on the right side. Uh, so you bend forward uh, with the chin basically pressed against the chest and you place your attention on um, your heart. And so the focal point here is the heart. When I say the heart, it does not correspond to the solar plexus, so the Ajna chakra, sorry, not the Ajna chakra, the, um, yeah, the, 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 the solar plexus uh, chakra in the yogic tradition. Rather, it's actually on the left side. So it corresponds in yoga to, in, uh, to the Hridaya chakra, the, the, because there actually is one as well. On the left side of the, of the chest, you have the Hridaya chakra, the heart chakra. And to some people say that it corresponds to the left nipple, uh, some people say that it's placed three centimeters uh, either above the left nipple or um, the sides. I mean, you know, uh, certain depends on who you uh, talk to. So the, the the mind focuses on this this particular focal point in the human body, and you repeat this prayer with your breath. Uh, so, for example, you inhale the first half of the, of the prayer and you exhale. The last time of the, the last part of the prayer, and what you do is you imagine that the um, that the, your your breath is actually going to that focal point on the left side of your of your chest. Um, very often, uh, the, um, uh, the 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 cast practitioners will use some something like a, a, a small chair, a meditation. A meditation stool, um, and invariably one of the main attributes of uh, of the Hesychast practitioners is what we call the Kombuskini, which is the um, the, the prayer rope. It's a, it's a, ro a rope made out of uh, black wool or uh, or black satin, um, and it has a hundred nuts. And these are organized in the following ways: you have one central nut. And you have like three times 33 nuts, uh, just like the Islamic, uh, basically, uh, Sibha, basically. And so that's used to counting, for counting the, um, the amounts of, uh, of repetitions of the Jesus prayer that, you, that your spiritual master uh, enjoins you to do. So uh, it's not like you can do as many as you want. So first, uh, very often, the, your starets, your spiritual master will tell you, okay, for this amount of time, let's say for the next six months, do 100 a, a day, for example, or 500 a day, I mean, it depends, right? And so that is why the, the monks, or not just the monks, but also the, the lay people who uh, practice um, the Hesychast path use the Kombuskini. And by the way, the Kombuskin is a very, the prayer rope is a very, 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 very old item in Christian monasticism and goes back all the way to Anthony the Great, who um, was, uh, who, who invented it. And um, so the, the knots of the prayer rope um, are, it's very interesting. So 
he was developing the prayer rope, but the devil would undo the knots um, that he was making. And so the angel, an angel came and taught him a method uh, whereby, so each knot is actually made out of seven crosses that you make with, with, with the rope. And so that basically prevents the devil from, uh, from approaching you um, when, when, when you're practicing, or, or to, it prevents, prevented the devil from undoing the knots. Um, as I'll see later, as I'll mention later, the, the prayer rope is going to be very important in the relationship of hesychasm with other religious traditions. And there's different levels of prayer. Like the, 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 the lowest form of prayer is just praying with your lips, right? Um, uh, when this is how, you know, children pray, pray. there's a very, uh, pray, there's a very beautiful clip by a Hesychast monk who died, you know, uh, recently, the elder Cleopa from Romania, who explains the different stages of prayer. And I would really encourage you to go on YouTube and watch this video. It's, it, the man was really a living saint. Um, and he suffered greatly during the, the, the era of communism in Romania. Um, Ceausescu was actually ruthless in his uh, persecution of the church. So he describes the different stages of prayer. And so, yeah, you have the, 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 you have the, the, the lower stages of prayer, which is, you know, the prayer through the, um, the prayer through, through, you know, just with your, with basically your mouth. Um, then you join the prayer of the mouth with basically, uh, you know, you, com you, you join the mind with the prayer. And then you have the whispered prayer. And then you have the prayer of the heart. And this, the prayer of the heart eventually le leads to, the, um, to the, the higher forms of prayer, which is contemplation. And then you have unitive prayer. And this is where you may even experience um, out-of-body experiences and um, you know, go through uh, experiences of ascending towards heaven, um, as it's mentioned in scripture as well. Uh, Serafino Masarov, who's nowadays one of the one of the major saints um, who's honored in um, in Russia, has a beautiful encounter with a nobleman by the name of uh, Motovilov. And during that meeting, um, Saint Serafino Masarov talks about the experience of the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit merges or descends into the human being and transforms into the human being. And so this is what Motovilov writes. Then Father Seraphim took me very firmly by the shoulders and said, we are both in the spirit of God now, my son. Why don't you look at me? I replied, I cannot look, Father, because your eyes are flashing, light, uh, flashing like lightning. Your face has become brighter than the sun, and my eyes ache with pain. Father, Seraf Ferris, Father Seraphim said, don't be alarmed, your godliness. Now you yourself have become as bright as I am. You are now in the fullness of the spirit of God yourself. Otherwise, you would not be able to see me as I am. Then bending his head towards me, he whispered softly in my ear, thank the Lord God for his un, um, unutterable mercy for us, to us. You saw that I did not even cross myself and only in my heart I prayed mentally to the Lord God. And I said within myself, Lord, grant him to see clearly with his bodily eyes that descent of thy spirit, which thou grantest to thy servants when thou art pleased to appear in the, in the light of thy manif manif magnificent glory. And you see, my son, the Lord instantly fulfilled the, the humble prayer of poor Seraphim. How then shall we not thank him for his unspeakable gift uh, to, uh, to us both? Even to the greatest hermits, my son, the Lord does not, get, does not always show his mercy in this way. This grace of God, like a loving mother, has been pleased to comfort your contrite heart at the intercession of the mother of God herself. But why, my son, do you not look, look me in the eyes? Just look and don't be afraid. The Lord is with us. After these words, I glanced at his face and there came over me an even greater reverent awe. Imagine in the center of the sun, in the dazzling light of the, its middle rays, the face of a man talking to you. You see the movement of his lips and the changing expression of his eyes. You hear his voice. You feel someone holding your shoulders. Yet you do not see his hands. You do not even see yourself or, or, or his figure, but only a blinding light 
spreading far uh, around for several yards and illuminating with its uh, glaring sheen both the snow uh, blanket um, which covered the forest glade and the snowflakes which uh, besprinkled me and father uh, and the, uh, the great elder. You can imagine the state I was in. The dialogue goes on uh, for 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 uh, you know for a while. So um, Saint Seraphim says, uh, "So can you can you feel this heat? And that is the heat of the Holy Spirit. Can you feel and and so on and so forth." So there's this description, and there's this experience, and then you know Saint Seraphim removes his, his hand from Motovilov's shoulder, and the experience stops. Right? And there are other similar uh, episodes uh, in other. Uh, traditions. Um, in any case, here's some uh, reflections on the Hezekiah tradition and on the mystical traditions. So I think a very obvious uh, comparison can be drawn between the methods used in um, Hezekiah and the one you find in Bhakti Yoga, especially the notion of Nam Japna of the, 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 the idea of that repeating the name of God um, and, and that in a way that is regulated with your breath. So you're repeating the name of God with your breath and focusing on a special focal point in your body is, a, uh, is an amazing way of preparing the terrain for divine grace to basically um, invade you and, and flood you and, and and um, you know, bring you back into um, into a state of of grace and of union with with, with God. There are no historical um, ties between both traditions uh, that we can name. Um, but it's very interesting that you have uh, uh, you know in these two civilizations a very very similar approach to the divine. Uh, through love and also the repetition of uh, God's names, um, especially in the Vaishnava tradition, where the, the names of Ram, of Lord Ram and Lord Krishna are so important, especially in the Gaudiya Vaishnava, uh, but also the, 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 the Nimbarki uh, Vaishnava tradition, where the name of Krishna is, uh, is so important in, in, uh, in helping the soul prepare the terrain for, for divine um, grace to basically uh, come and conquer the heart of, of the devotee. Now, I've said, I've put here Tibetan Buddhism, Islam, and lucid dreaming, but I would have to start with the fourth one, which is lucid dreaming. Why do I mention this? So what is lucid dreaming, first of all? Uh, lucid dreaming is the ability of um, it's a skill. Uh, it's a, a state in which you are dreaming. You, so your body is fast asleep. You are dreaming. And then within the dream, you are aware that you are dreaming. And so um, there's scientific studies about this. So this is no new age stuff. This, is, has been, this has been medically proven now in the um, 1980s by Stephen Laberge and other people at the University of Stanford. So this is a you know this is a solid scientific fact. It seems that children have a natural ability of lucid dreaming that they lose uh, when socialization socialization starts. And uh, what's really interesting is that is that um, you have um, you have one specific religious tradition that has created an entire yoga. Uh, that uses lucid dreaming, which is Tibetan dream yoga. Uh, Tibetan dream yoga uses lucid dreaming as a way to continue meditation practice whilst you're asleep. So you meditate during the day, you go to sleep, and then within, within the dream, you continue meditating. And it's said that any meditation or prayer or affirmation that you do within a lucid dream is seven times more powerful and intense than anything done during the daytime. And so I've been looking into the, um, the history of, 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 loose, of, of basically Tibetan dream yoga. Why? Because there's no other form of Buddhism that has 
that uses lucid dreaming in the same way that Tibetan dream yoga uses lucid dreaming. So where does this come from? And so anyone who studied Tibetan Buddhism knows that Tibetan Buddhism has been very permeable to foreign influences. And, um, and these foreign influences are, are not something that Tibetan Buddhists are insecure, insecure about. They're, they're very happy to, um, they're very pragmatic. They're, um, uh, what really is important in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, especially in the yogic tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, is not so much if a, if a, a practice is authentic or not, you know, if it's been taught by the historical Buddha or not. What really matters is, does it work? And in a sense, I like the attitude because it's a sort of, um, you know, it's a sort of uh, spiritual mi mixed martial arts uh, where, where, where people focus not, not so much on the purity of the style, but rather on the effectiveness of, um, of the results achieved uh, through a, spirit, a given spiritual practice. Now, Tibetan uh, dream yoga gets codified around the 10th century with a document known as the Six Yogas of Naropa. There's no trace of lucid dreaming in India prior to this. And there's no, uh, there's no trace of lucid dreaming as a spiritual practice in any other form of Tibetan Buddhism. What's really interesting, though, is that there's a clear mention of Javad ibn Hayyan, the very famous um, alchemist and mystic, was a disciple of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq in the Tibetan canon. He actually is part of the Tanjur, like the, 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 probably the most important canonical collection of texts of Tibetan Buddhism. So he's included that in there as Jabir the Yogi. And so um, most probably Tibetan dream yoga takes its origins in Islam. Uh, and especially the mystical practices around the Ahl Bayt. I say Ahl Bayt, I'm not going to, to use the term Shia because um, um, as all of you may be aware of, even with, within Shiism, there's a very strong anti-mystical tendency that has taken over um, Shiism over time. Uh, and, and, and this tendency already starts during the Abbasid period. Um, and if you ask me, um, it's probably the reason why the 12th Imam actually went into occultation, not so much because of the Abbasid rulers who by that time had become um, the puppet rulers of, of the, uh, the Buyids and they had not much to fear from, from these caliphs, but rather the fact that um, the community that claimed to follow them was being taken over by people who um, were deeply anti-mystical and basically, how to put it, try to try to uh, censor the tradition in such a way that it be in agreement with, you know, Abbasid state Islam. In any case, uh, so that's why I'm, I'm saying the Islam of the Ahl Bayt, because you find within, you find the Shia mystics, but also the, the, the Sufis who are, a, uh, if, you know, at, at the start, um, sociologically speaking, a, a Sunni phenomenon. So uh, you find these practices around the Ahl Bayt. And what's really interesting is that, um, so I, at the moment I'm looking at a text from the 19th century written by uh, Muhadith from Najaf by the name of Mirza Nuri Tabarsi, who wrote a four volume encyclopedia on, um, on mystical dream practices. And so uh, entirely based on Hadith, by the way. So. You have a very important. Um, you have a very important hadith uh, in this context, which is that, uh, which is the following one: "Tanamu uh, aini wa qalbi So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "My my eyes are asleep, but my heart is awake." And this is and this is explained in the hadith literature that this is explicitly a reference to the fact that the Prophet is always awake. In a state of yakdan, whether he is, um, you know, quote unquote, physically awake or sleeping, he's always conscious, right? Now, this hadith is actually a paraphrase of the Song of Songs, Canto 5, verse 2, that I've mentioned. Uh, I'm asleep, 
but my heart waketh. And this is the term, this is the verse that the Hezekiah tradition uses to define what an accomplished Hezekiah is. An accomplished Hezekiah is someone who prays whether he or she is awake or asleep. So how can you pray if you're asleep? Well, you can only do that if in the dream state and the deep and the deep, deep sleep state, you're actually conscious, right? So there is the idea here that, so I'm proposing the idea that the Hezekiahs were pretty much the first ones who accidentally discovered lucidity in the dream realm. And I, I call it collateral lucidity. So they, they're aware of the fact that they're, 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 you know, that they're dreaming. Um, and that also helps them because when you're dreaming, you're entering your unconscious and you're basically hacking at your unconscious. So for example, if you suffer from the, the you know, any of the logismoid that I mentioned, such as, you know, lust, greed, and so on and so forth, you can go into your unconscious and basically look at ways of healing that, uh, at a, a very deep level, um, and actually much more effective way than basically, you know, just, just engaging in, 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 in with these things in a, in, in, during the daytime. When you go into the dream realm, you can access your unconscious. You can face your fears, your, the, the, the things that drive you, your, your shadows, uh, your inner demons, and you can actually pacify all of that. Uh, as Jung said, you know, uh, you can you can illuminate, you can bring light into the darkness, and that is pretty much also, in a way, another reason why I, I use the occasion of Good Friday to do that. In the same way as God, sorry, as as Christ died on the cross um, and entered Hades. Hades is the underworld. For three days, Christ enters the underworld and conquers the gates of hell, uh, it, it illuminates the underworld before the resurrection. And that is exactly what, you know, what a mystic does, right? You have to die to yourself. And then after that, you have to go into the deeper levels of your being, that all the, the nasty, you know, unresolved stuff that's been, you know, lying there for, for, for years, and you have to bring light to it. You have to reconcile it. You have to um, redeem it. And that is only when uh, resurrection, the, the spiritual resurrection actually takes place. So my theory is that um, these practices from Hezekazen uh, were pretty much known to the environment of the prophet. And why do I say this? Remember the prayer robe that I spoke about, the Kumbuskini? Well, it turns out that if you read the sources, the first masbaha, the first rosary that has been used in Islam, that was gifted to Fatima to Zahra, alayhi salam, was a black prayer robe. And there's only one tradition in the world that uses a black prayer robe, and that's the Hezekiah tradition. And I proposed the idea that the Prophet was pretty much seems to have been pretty much familiar with this tradition as well. And that uh, it's therefore only normal to find these parallels between the Hezekiah tradition and the own, and then the own, uh, and, and the very, you know, spiritual practice of the prophet, the, uh, the, 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 the spiritual seclusion. Uh, so the, uh, the tahanuth that he underwent um, in the mountains around, around Mecca. Um, and the fact that he uses phrases that are very much, uh, that are very uh, emblematic of the Hezekiah tradition to um, describe his spiritual state, uh, which, by the way, is, you know, it's, it's awake in, in, in Sanskrit as, you know, as a, as a Buddha. So the prophet was someone who was in a state of bodhi, of, in, of um, full, uh, full awareness, of full um, divine awareness whether he was awake or asleep, because even when he was in, in sleep, whether he was dreaming or in deep sleep, he was, still, uh, he was still lucid, he was still conscious. And that is what an enlightened being is. A, a, an enlightened being is someone who is conscious 
in all states of, of, of basically of, of, of consciousness, uh, be it um, wakefulness, uh, dream, or deep sleep. So, uh, and so in a sense, I'd like to propose the idea, and I've discussed it with, with um, Tibetan Buddhists themselves, don't have a problem with that, and with other academic specialists about it, is that Tibetan dream yoga seems to have had its roots in the Eastern Mediterranean amongst the, amongst, you know, um, Eastern, um, Eastern, Eastern Christians, and that this practice uh, morphed uh, into the spiritual practice that you find amongst the Ahl Bayt's. And this uh, spiritual practice within, from the Ahl Bayt's basically moves into the Sufi circles, but also the, uh, the Shi'i mystical circles. And then through the uh, Silk Road, ends up in Tibet, and then emerges with uh, the, the yogic schools of uh, Nalanda, and then produces uh, Tibetan dream yoga, which uh, in the end brings lucid dreaming as a spiritual practice at, a, at another level, because um, in Tibetan dream yoga, it, it deals with the very nature of, uh, you, use spirit, you use lucid dreaming in order to um, explore the very nature of reality and of consciousness. And I'll stop here. Wonderful, thank you. Amazing talk. Thank, thank you very Khudafis. much. Khudafis. Yeah, thank you, Khudafis. Khudafis Abbasab.